Chris Smith joins us now. Can I shoot straight into the question? And it's a fascinating one. Why are there more humans that are right-hand dominant? Was this through evolution? But the question continues. But how does this explain how writing styles were developed through various cultures? Arabic, Hebrew, right from right to left, top to bottom, rows. Chinese start with their methods of top to bottom, writing right to left on their pages, uh, which have now modernized to left to right, top to bottom rows on their pages. And the Greek had left to right, top to bottom, like how we write the English language now uh, and how we read our printed books. Maybe you can bring light to all of that uh, diversity in style. We, we don't know. Uh, when it comes to handedness, why is it that 90% of the human population there or thereabouts are right-handed? We have no idea. All we can do is speculate, and we can also say, well, what do other animals look like? Are there any other animals that show the same very strong bias towards using one particular body part and they and do it at the level of the population like we do? And the answer is no. We're unique in that respect. People have looked at uh, our evolution, and it looks like it's not a modern thing. The best evidence for this is there's a study that was done, I think, from the University of Montpellier in France, where they looked at cave paintings. And they looked specifically at the cave paintings one would make with a blowpipe, where you fill a pipe with, with some kind of pigment, and then you place a hand against the wall of the cave and blow to make an imprint of your hand against the wall. Now, when they ask school children to do this, because most people are right-handed, they tend to hold the blowpipe with the right hand and use the non-dominant left hand as the template. And when you ask them to do this and you count up how many left and right hands you get, intriguingly, you get exactly the same ratio as if you look on cave paintings from 50, 60,000 years ago. And the obvious deduction is, well, our ancestors then had the same hand dominance as the modern era. So handedness is much more ancient than just the modern era and writing and so on. So what might account for this? Well, we know, for instance, that the other human unique trait is language. And so many people have said, well, we know that language originates on the left side of the brain. And this makes the left side of the brain dominant in that respect. And it could be that handedness and dominance of brain go hand in hand with language and therefore because the left brain is dominant in the majority of people for handedness and language that's why we see this bias towards using our right hand but all that does is kick the can down the road because it doesn't explain why we would choose that side of the brain to control our right hand and do it at such a high proportion of the population. So we really don't know why it is that we have we have evolved that way. Other animals haven't evolved that way. Other animals do have handedness, but roughly equal numbers of the population use one hand or paw or fin versus the other half. So it's 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 roughly balanced. There are a few species, a handful of species, kangaroos, for example, which do tend to show one particular side as, as a preference, but they're in the minority. So it means we're special. But we don't know why we're special and we don't know why we've evolved to be like that. But there, there is something way back in our evolution and almost certainly part and parcel of some of the other special human traits that we possess, like language, that probably drives this. I didn't know I wanted to ask that question until that question was asked. So big thank you to Vernon for that question. Now, a question for the Naked Scientist reads as follows. Given that both Bilhazia and malaria are present on more than one continent, and require disease hosts, snails and mosquitoes, the diseases and hosts must have evolved in tandem from pre-continental drift ancestors. Does Dr. Smith have any opinions on this notion? Mariette with her question. The answer is that the Earth has rejigged and reorganized its land masses many, many times over evolutionary history. And if we go back um, X number of hundred million years, the continents were in different positions than they are today. India was down where Antarctica is. The African and American continents were close together. Australia was in con contact with many of the other land masses. And as the Earth reorganised itself and rejigged itself over hundreds of millions of years, some land masses that had been in connection and contact with each other moved apart. Others have never been in contact uh, in the modern or more modern geological eras, so as a result they, they don't have any of the cross-sections of animals and things, because that was the consequence. When you've got one massive land mass, we used to talk about Pangaea and, and Gondwana, for example, there was an opportunity for animals, plants and uh, 
insects and, and, and smaller things like parasites that are mentioned to be all together in one place. And then those complex evolutionary life cycles can emerge where exactly as, as is pointed out, you have a, a particular organism, a parasite, which can use multiple hosts, the insect to get around, the human to be infected, other non-human primates to be infected, so malaria, mosquito, human or primate, dengue virus, same story. So it, it, they will have a common ancestor way back in history, but as things have, have moved apart and geography has intervened, you then get speciation and specialization in different parts of the world, which is why you will see different variants of these things in different geographies. They come from a common ancestor, but as this spreads across the earth and the earth then changes and rejigs where, where things are and, and land bridges are broken, you end up with a, a specialization to a particular region of these things. But yes, in order for these complicated life cycles to have emerged, they must have a common origin where all these things are together in one place in the same place at the same time. Then we're going to move on to matters arising, chatting with the naked scientist, Dr. Chris Smith, the chair of science at the University of Cambridge. We want you to rule on the pronunciation of aspartame. <laughs> First, <laughs> secondly, we want you to comment on a World Health Organization uh, quote this morning out of the New York Times that it could cause cancer. Well, the first point is what is aspartame and i've given the game away in terms of the pronunciation there haven't i it is a, a molecule made by joining an aspartic acid which is one of the amino acids with a, a phenylalanine which is another amino acid and you link them together chemically and you get this molecule which when you put it in your mouth binds to the same structures that would normally detect sugar and sweetness and it activates them. In fact, it activates them much better than sugar. But because it's not a sugar molecule, it doesn't fit with your metabolism. So you can't break it down and get sugar energy from it. You only get a tiny amount of energy from digesting those two amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. So it subverts your taste system into thinking something is much sweeter than it otherwise is. Now, does this aspartame, aspartic acid is said as aspartic acid, hence it's aspartame, does this cause cancer? Well, the evidence is that over decades of consumption in humans, there is not a hugely strong signal showing that if you eat this stuff, you're at high risk of cancer. The way we do these studies, they are not done in an interventional case control way. They are done observationally. And what that means is that you take a group of people, the population, you take data on how many of those people are exposed to this stuff and at what sort of doses and you then look at their health outcomes over long periods of time and you look for any associations but that's the best you can do you can only say in people who drink a lot of this or eat a lot of this there appears to be an increased risk of a certain factor a certain kind of cancer but it doesn't prove that this thing causes this outcome you've got to be really careful about making those sorts of assumptions because it may be that there's confounding going on for instance um, the classic one that everyone's taught at medical school is initially people thought coffee caused pancreatic cancer because when they looked at the coffee consumption rates and they looked at pancreatic cancer rates they said ah oh, look people with a high coffee intake also have a high pancreatic cancer rate or higher pancreatic cancer rate but when you then look harder you see that when people drink a coffee, if they're a smoker, they're very often likely to smoke at the same time. And it wasn't the coffee that was causing the pancreatic cancer, it was the cigarette in their right hand that was doing that. So aspartame could be a cause of cancer, but it could be that the lifestyle that goes with a high consumption of aspartame is actually the cause of any increase in cancer risk. For instance, a person who's taking a lot of aspartame might be overweight, and taking it because they want to reduce their weight. Well, we know that being overweight is an independent risk factor for certain kinds of cancer, like bowel cancer, for example. It's not the aspartame that causes the cancer, it's the life cycle, lifestyle that leads to the use of aspartame, which is doing that. Now, there are some studies in animals where they give animals extremely high doses. But again, you've got to be cautious how you interpret animal studies because animals are not humans. They have different metabolic pathways and different ways of handling things. Just think about the fact that we all love chocolate, or most of us do, but feed that to a dog and you'll kill it. 
dogs can't handle the chemicals in chocolate the way we can. So their metabolism is different. They're really closely related to us. They're similar to us in many, many ways, but they're, they're still sufficiently different that there's that toxic effect. So we've got to be very cautious how we take an animal study and apply that to a human as well. So this is not on the list of things that causes cancer like asbestos does, but it's on a list of things where there might be a signal there. It warrants further investigation, and a very, very heavy consumption might be associated with the risk, but we don't have concrete evidence yet to say this causes this and therefore we shouldn't use it. My son in Scotland had PSC, but thankfully received a new liver last year. Now he's been diagnosed with UC. I know the two diseases are linked. What I want to know is why he's got UC a year after the new liver. Is the PSC still there? The question from Colleen in Deep River. Hi, Colleen. Well, what she's referring to is PSC is primary sclerosing cholangitis. And this is an abnormality in which there is degradation of the bile ducts in the liver. These are the things that collect the bile from the liver and put it into the gallbladder and then into the intestine so we can uh, absorb fats. There are some associations between some forms of inflammatory bowel disease and UC as ulcerative colitis. There's another one called Crohn's disease, which are linked to these sorts of conditions. They probably are immunologically linked and we don't know exactly why some people get ulcerative colitis we know that it is associated with an upset in the flora and fauna the small microorganisms that live in your guts but we don't know exactly whether that is cause or effect but we just know that that this is associated with the inflammation in the intestine and that there is an association between having that and having the liver disease it might be the two things occurred completely independently because not everyone who gets ulcerative colitis gets liver disease and vice versa so it could be that there's there's no connection there on the other hand it could be that because of the immune effects of having a liver transplant there is something that's been tickled or triggered to make ulcerative colitis happen or it could be because some of the drugs that are used to control one thing could as a side reaction in some individuals have this happen the good thing is it's been picked up ulcerative colitis can be controlled and it can be controlled well with drugs as long as it's kept under under control and well monitored let's hope he's in that category and i'm, I'm delighted to hear that the liver problem got fixed and let's move on to an itchy topic. Why do we itch, Dr. Smith? Well, as soon as we start talking about this, everyone listening to this program is going to start scratching. And uh, you can already feel that itch on the back of your neck or the top of your leg or just at the side of your abdomen. You think, yeah, I'll have a scratch there. It's one of those things, isn't it? The reason we have an itchy or a sensation of itch in the first place is almost certainly from our evolutionary origins because things that crawl and creep over your skin will be trying to get into your body as a parasite. Either we heard about mosquitoes earlier trying to transmit things like malaria or yellow fever or dengue. Uh, there's also certain parasites, worms, that burrow through the skin, which can then become intestinal, but they come in through the skin. So the skin is a portal of entry for various things you don't want in your body. It's also a, uh, the first defense against external irritants and things. So if something makes your skin itch, it makes you pay attention to that part of your body, which in turn makes you a take away the cause, whether that's a creepy crawly trying to bite you and infect you with something or a chemical you've got on your skin, a plant that you've rubbed up against that's irritated, a patch of skin that's got damaged and is at risk of infection. It makes you pay attention to it so that you safeguard it and don't put yourself at further risk. The mechanism behind itch is that there is a population of nerve cells in the skin. They're called itch-specific nerve cells. They're very fine uh, tiny nerve, nerve fibers that run up to the spinal cord and they use a specific signaling pathway and when they become active combined with signals about location of the skin they tell the brain this part of the skin itches and when you scratch what you're doing is recruiting a population of nerve cells which are sensitive to the scratch sensation, pain fibres, and when you activate the pain nerves in that patch of skin, they feed back onto your spinal cord and inhibit the nerve fibres that turn on the itch sensation. So this is why scratching gives relief from an itch. The itch gets your attention, guides your attention to that part of the body, and the scratch suppresses the itching because it triggers pain, and the pain by activating those nerve fibres, turns off the itch nerve fibres. OK, we've got two uh, via voice notes. Let's take uh, a listen, Joe. Uh, good morning, team. Good morning, team. 
Uh, just a quick question for the doc. Um, what forms a uh, kidney stone, or how does it form, and what uh, can we stay away from, or how can we avoid getting kidney stones? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Very, very painful if you get a kidney stone. It's excruciating. And um, pa patients writhe around and, and say, do anything you like to me because it's so painful. I just I don't know what to do with myself. Kidney stones are a buildup of insoluble salts inside the kidney, which is the structure. You have two of them. If you put your hands on your hips above your pelvis where your fingers are, are touching the, your back, that's roughly uh, uh, on top of where your kidneys are under the surface. So kidneys filter blood. And they filter out from blood waste products, and this includes salts. And those salts then flow down through a collecting system to form urine, and the body, having scavenged back the bits it wants, produces a concentrated fluid that uh, is then stored in the bladder until it's safe and convenient to get rid of it. But because you're producing a concentrated material inside the kidney, if there are certain chemicals in there at high enough concentration, they do have the opportunity to begin, just like in your kettle, to form scale you can form solid material because the high concentration does encourage that to happen uh, the most common cause of stones is is oxalic acid stones and calcium and other forms of calcium calcium oxalate there are also some people with metabolic reasons to build up the the um, products and, and deposits inside the kidneys cysteine can also build up there there's a certain metabolic syndrome i think it's called heart nups disease where uh, you, you build up these sorts of stones but the reason this happens it can be incidental it's, it's quite common that it happens just by chance it can be caused by abnormal anatomy if you have kidneys that are developmentally not quite right and so as a result, the urine flow might be slightly different or it might take longer. There might be areas of stasis. The urine hangs around for longer inside the kidney before it can get out. That can do it. If you have infection or scarring in your kidney because of infection, that can do it. So there's a range of different reasons why this happens. The bottom line is if it happens, A, you've got to treat it acutely. So make the person more comfortable. Then image them to investigate why this has happened and, f and find out what we can do to remove any stones. They might need the lithotripsy, the breaking down of stones to, to, to get rid of any residual stone that's there. And then looking at why this person is, is at risk now of, of having kidney stones. The, the biggest risk factor is age. Also, men tend to get it more than women. Smoking, it makes it worse. And um, if you've had big courses of antibiotics earlier in your life, it can put you at risk because really interesting. There are microbes that live in our gut that break down things like oxalic acid, which is in small amounts in plant material and if you remove those bacteria through taking lots of antibiotics and lose them from your microbiome you then lose that line of defense so those chemicals in your diet can get into your bloodstream and they're more likely to get then into your kidneys and, and be deposited as stones and we've got great questions uh, on autism that i wanted to put through to you on polycythemia of Viera that I wanted to put through to you. We don't have time. We've got time for this last voice note and hopefully uh, a brief answer. Let's take a listen, Joe. Hi, good morning, Clarence. Could you please ask your guest? I was incarcerated 2016, came out 2020. But you know a new one? Oh, you wouldn't know a new one that comes into the prison or the correctional center. They have to sleep on the floor only with a uh, blanket. I'm having a problem now with my back that I'm sleeping in a bed. Why is the after effects only happening now to me that I'm sleeping on the mattress, I'm sleeping on the bed in the uh, base and mattress why is it only affecting me now? We can just ask you, okay. this, please. Um, I don't know if you want to venture an answer on that one, Dr. Chris Smith. Well, the answer is that mechanical back pain is very, very common. And at any one moment in time, perhaps one person in five is having some kind of back problem. So given how common it is, we can't say that the period of incarceration and sleeping on the floor caused this to happen. But at the same time, if there was some kind of injury that was sustained at that time, that might be linked to it. Mechanical back pain increases in frequency with age because arthritis, which is the, the um, damage to joints between bones, 
becomes more common with age. So it may well be that this was going to happen anyway and that there is some arthritis in this person's back and that that is causing their mechanical back pain. Or it could just be uh, one of those things, incidental, and it will go away. Because what we know is that this is it, this is a transient thing. In many people, they get this problem, they have the problem for a while, and then it gets better of its own accord. So the answer is, I can't say for sure that sleeping on the floor caused this to happen. It may be that it brought forward a thing that was going to happen anyway, or made it made it more obvious. So... I would advise that person to to go and see a doctor because then they can see if this is something that can be readily remedied for them. Dr. Chris Smith, Chair of Science at the University of Cambridge, we thank you for your time. As always, we can go on through till 12 o'clock and still we wouldn't have been able to get to all of the questions. Compelling questions again came through late and we were unable to put it to the naked scientist.